Um, that being said, creating consistency in OER, cost savings, and return on investment discussions. Uh, please welcome Katie Zabak uh, with us. Great, thanks so much, Kyle. And um, can everybody see my screen? I saw one thumbs up. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you all so much for having me with you today. I am um, looking forward to talking to you about some work I've been doing with the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. I was supposed to be joined by um, Jenny Parks, who is a vice president with MEC. Um, but she is unable to join us today. Um, she is traveling on the road, but I see that Annika is here as well, and she has been a key part of this team. So Annika, if at any point in time you wanna um, jump in or share thoughts, uh, we'd love to have uh, you do that. So we'll kind of start there. So um, I'm gonna be talking about cost savings and return on investment. And um, this project is a project that was part of something called the National Consortium for Open Education Resources, um, NCOER. And what really excites me about NCOER is it is a partnership of all of the education compacts across the country. And these, for those of you who don't know, the compacts have members who represent large systems of higher education, um, governing on state agencies who oversee higher education, as well as legislators. And um, so they have a really good policy focus. And as you know, policy has been a critical part of helping to move forward um, OER efforts in recent years. And so it's really cool that these organizations have been able to partner as part of NCOER. They received a grant from the Hewlett Foundation to do a set of collective work together. And one of the things that they all were had agreed to do is they all agreed to um, look at us or research a set of things. And um, MEC has had a reputation for looking at things like cost savings in higher education over the last couple decades. They've done this um, for as long as I've known them working in higher education. And so they, uh, so they really took on a project to look at cost savings and return on investment in OER because they heard from all of you out there in the field that that was something that was needed. So they brought me in. My name is, I realize I didn't fully introduce myself, but I'm Katie Zabak. I am um, a consultant with Zabak Solutions and I've been working in higher education and specifically in higher education policy for almost two decades now. It's hard to believe. Um, and one of the things about me is that I'm really a generalist. So I worked uh, at the Colorado Department of Higher Education where I was the policy director and had the great opportunity to work on multiple different policies, including our state level OER policy. Um, and so when I heard from Jenny that they were looking for a researcher to do this project, I said, okay, let me look at it. And I went and did a scan and I realized that there's a lot of research about OER in general. This, um, this community researches itself really well. And that there wasn't a need necessarily for more research on cost savings, but more so for somebody to be able to communicate to the policymakers and the high level decision makers um, what should be done um, when they think about cost savings and when they're uh, when they're trying to understand OER initiatives. So as a result, um, that is what we focus this research on. So our first step was to identify a community that could help inform this effort. So we put together the OER cost savings and ROI work group. You can see the members here. And what we really tried to do is get a broad swath of individuals who represented policy organizations, states, um, systems, and institutions and even faculty and really make sure that we had a set of diverse perspectives on this 
uh, work groups so that we could put together a set of principles and frameworks that you all can use and that decision makers can use to make more consistent decisions around cost savings and return on investment. So here is what we all agreed that we were doing. So we are creating common principles to improve consistency and reliability in the field for measuring cost savings and return on investment in OER. You know, I'll talk a lot about how we thought about return on investment because um, that was a very rich discussion that we had and we actually ended up uh, using a different approach than your traditional return on investment approach in our paper. The second uh, thing that we really spent a lot of time talking about is who are our stakeholders? And the reality of it is, is that some policymakers will pick up this paper and read it and some decision makers will pick up this paper and read it, but who's more likely to read this paper is advocates for OER, which is why you all are so important. Because what we hope is that advocates for OER will read this paper, which is going to be released in April, and they will use the messages and the approaches in this paper as guidelines for the work that they do and for the conversations they have with the decision makers. So these are some of the key questions that guided our research. These um, really provided a starting point for us and you'll see results that came from our analysis of this. Really, we focused on a number of different activities. First, we did a pretty extensive literature review around the cost savings literature. Uh, second, we did a series of stakeholder interviews that included the people who were on our work group, but also included other members of the OER field. And then we also did a survey of state systems that we put out through the doers network to really understand what was happening in our state systems when it comes to cost savings. How are they already thinking about it? The report has this content in it. So the first thing it does is it starts with uh, providing a baseline of what do we mean when we talk about OER, especially for policy audiences. There's a number of definitions out there, and we really wanted to focus on consistency when we're talking to policymakers about OER. The second thing it does is it provides an overview of state and system level OER initiatives from those survey results and also from an analysis we did of policies that are out there. The third thing it does is it presents a series of principles for measuring OER cost savings um, to students and understanding the broader uh, dimensions of costs and benefits when it comes to OER. And so these are really meant to be a centering piece that people can go to and double check to make sure that when we talk about OER, especially from a policy context and a decision-making context, that we're doing so in a way that takes into account the critical factors that the research tells us we should be thinking about. And the final thing is that we developed two frameworks and these are frameworks are designed, this is really where we're hoping consistency comes in, is we have a student cost savings framework that provides guidance around how you might measure cost savings and a set of best practices for what people are doing so that we can communicate clearly how we're measuring it within different contexts. And then the third thing is a cost benefit framework. And we chose a cost benefit framework rather than a return on investment framework because um, this is a tool that's used in public policy. And what it allows you to do is look at costs and benefits as you look at different stakeholder groups. Oftentimes the return that we talk about in, in OER is student cost savings. But the investment typically comes from an institution or from a state. And although those entities do see some returns, for example, increased retention, they are the, the major benefits we typically talk about are benefits that are going to students. And so what we wanted to do is be able to break, um, make it really transparent who is, who is paying and who is getting benefits. And so you'll see how that framework plays out later on in my presentation. So let's go ahead and jump into why this project is important. Um, we think that this project, you know, the major audience is going to be the advocates for OER, but it's relevant to a number of different audiences. First, our advocates who need a 
concise statement that clearly articulates and communicates the value. We know that that's often done with cost savings. We want decision makers, people at institutions, people at a policy level to have a consensus-based metric that they can draw from um, and that they can customize for their own contexts. We want leaders, uh, whether those are institutional leaders or um, department leaders, to understand good work in progress that's already been done in this area and to be able to draw from it. We want practitioners who have tons on their plate to be able to take something and put it into use immediately, a shortcut, if you will, to answering the key questions that so many people ask, ask them. And then finally, we wanna make sure that we as a field are continuing to ensure that we are providing the benefits that we think that we are providing. Um, there's always evolution in a innovative, approach like OER, we're going to constantly see changes, we're going to see places where we're doing really well and places where we might want to make improvements. And we think that this measure and these approaches um, can help us with that. So the first uh, part of the paper that we I talked about earlier is the definition. So this is the definition that our work group adopted and it comes from Sparks Policy Playbook. It is also reflected in upcoming legislation is my understanding and prior legislation. So many different stakeholders have weighed into this and we think it really clearly articulates to policymakers what we mean when we talk about open education resources. So it, it's not just textbooks, right? It's teaching and learning materials. Um, it is offered freely to use in at least one form. And it either resides in the public domain or has been released under an open copyright license that allows for its free use, modification, and sharing with, with attribution. Um, and you can see the various different elements of that down at the bottom of this uh, slide. And what you'll see in the paper is a comparison of how OER relates to other uh, initiatives that might also reduce costs to students, but don't necessarily have all the same benefits that we see in, our, in OER. The next um, thing that we talk about in the paper is context. So we talk about the typical like, types of legislation, which from our analysis are that um, states have largely focused in three different areas when they're looking at OER. One, they've done a lot of planning and studying how we can make textbooks less expensive. A lot of states have put together councils and various different bodies that some of you might be part of in order to think about how this works within a state's context or within the context of their institutions. The second thing that states have done is they've invested in OER initiatives. So there's a number of initiatives out there that have been funded by state governments. It was very fun to get to be part of that in Colorado. And I know that there's a number of others out there in the country. Um, there's also been initiatives that have been funded that have been funded by funders. So what I found really interesting is that a lot of states were able to leverage state programs and grow those state programs through um, through partnerships with philanthropic organizations. And then the last uh, piece of type of legislation that is quite popular or that is embedded into legislation that encompasses the earlier two things is course marking. So this is when, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with course marking. It, uh, it's when institutions are required to let students know which courses have OER resources or oftentimes low cost resources are also included. So that's kind of the most popular pieces of legislation that we saw. We also, from our survey, we discovered that the vast majority of state and systems who have programs are measuring cost savings already. So this is already something that's happening right now. And we hope that the findings and the principles in this report will allow people to maybe even better align the way that we're already doing things. The other thing we talked a lot about is how important it is to acknowledge that OER um, efforts are doing more than just 
helping with cost savings for students. And so we wanted to understand who's already tracking the other benefits of OER. And you can see here the different types of benefits that are being tracked by systems who responded to the survey. So things like DFWI rates, student satisfaction, course completion rates are very common. Um, and then a couple of sites talked about um, looking at equitable outcomes, enrollment rates, and also um, faculty engagement processes. So this slide gets us to our six principles, which are really, like I said, the foundation of this work. Um, and I'll quickly walk through them. You can read more about them in the paper when it's released. But the first is principle one, what you need to know depends on where you sit. So when I talk to a legislator, they do not need the same level of detail as a department chair who might be having to make budgetary decisions based on uh, OER costs and benefits. So for legislators, that means that scale is going to be a really important, magnitude of impact is going to be really important, and it means that um, direction is going to be really important, but getting the actual measures 100% correct in all cases is far less important for them. On the contrary, if I'm talking to a budget a director who's going to have to make changes to their budget, I need to be much more specific with the measures that I use around both student cost savings, but also around um, understanding the costs and benefits of an OER effort. And so that is an important thing to think about. Principle two is that access to cor course materials should be equitable. So one of the things that's really important here is that not all students buy textbooks. And there's a lot of reasons. For some students, it is a choice. For other students, it is not. We don't really have a good grasp around um, for each student what is going on. But what we do know is that when instructors build courses, they add course material to those courses because it's essential for learning the content that they are teaching. And so if certain students are not having access to that course material, it has negative consequences. And especially when we think about um, when we think about things at the policy level, we need to be really cautious about um, the kinds of assumptions that we make in cost savings uh, in cost savings equations. So for example, um, many are adjusting for whether the actual behavior of students in terms of purchasing textbooks or purchasing course material when they think about cost savings. And though that gets us to an accurate measure of cost savings, it might also embed the, um, the inequities that exist in student behaviors. So if I have an institution where I have a lower income students who are less likely to be to purchase their course material. And there's another institution down the street who, where all students purchase the course material and we both implement the same approach. We both replace all of our gateway English courses with uh, OER. And then we do a cost savings uh, calculation based off of an adjusted number. If I'm that institution that has everybody buy OER or everybody buy their course material, it's going to look like I save students more money than if I'm the other institution. And so that's why we have to be very careful about the kinds of assumptions that we make. And we need to make sure that those assumptions um, don't embed any inequities. Um, principle three is that integrating learning materials is not unique to OER. We know that good course design re requires thoughtful integration of course material. And so when we calculate, when we look at the costs of OER in particular, we need to look uh, um, at them against the baseline of what, what it would cost otherwise if we were integrating other kinds of material into the courses. Um, we know OER probably costs more, but we know that not all of the costs of integrating OER are unique. So thinking about that in our own initiatives, especially when we're thinking about department level decisions or institutional level decisions. Principle four is that adopting or adapting existing OER can reduce costs. We have invested a lot in creating existing OER. And so thinking about how that those efforts um, can 
help reduce costs, how we can leverage those existing efforts out there, um, I think is a really important thing, especially as we're thinking about the costs and benefits of different approaches. I think it's really easy to uh, invest in institutions creating OER, and they're especially for places where there's large catalogs thinking about how do we invest in the implementation of OER, not just the creation. And then principle five is that OER supports learning at least as well as commercial resources. Um, so there is a growing body of evidence that has um, shown that students who are in courses that use OER for support are at, in general doing as well, if not better than students who are not in those courses. And we continue to see that uh, literature growing. I think it's really important to note though that OER is not necessarily magic. Um, we still have to have good course design. The resources still have to be used well within courses in order for them to be effective at supporting teaching and learning. And what I also found was really interesting in the research is that oftentimes OER efforts have this conflating um, impact of putting more focus on teaching and learning or high quality teaching and learning. And so if there are catalysts for that, that's great. Um, and we have to be aware of like, what, what is it that is driving the benefit? And then the last thing is, the last principle is that OER has benefits beyond cost savings that should be acknowledged when we're thinking about cost savings. And so just making it a practice to in look at cost savings beyond, or sorry, to look at benefits beyond just student cost savings and continue to grow the research on what are the benefits beyond cost savings, I think is essential. I think it is exciting that there's a lot of other organizations that are already undertaking more research in this area and are continuing to think about this. Um, and so it's just a matter of continuing to use them and to learn from the research that comes out. So those are our principles. I will pause there quickly to see if anybody has questions um, before I move on to the frameworks. Okay, so we will go on to our frameworks next. So we wanted to create kind of a step-by-step -step process for how to measure cost savings. And the good news is most people are doing it the same way. It starts with identifying the courses and sections that use OER. And that's why the definition we talked about earlier is so important and making sure that staff and faculty members know that definition so that they can identify if they have courses that use OER is really important. Um, and things like course marking help make this easier for some systems and institutions. I know that Minnesota has put that into their senior or their, their university information system. So it's relatively easy as long as the data that's going into that system is accurate. It's relatively easy for them to identify which courses are using OER. I know it's not going to be that easy for all of for everybody. So some states or institutions collect it directly from faculty members, and any of those approaches is good, but or is is appropriate, right? Like we do what we need to do in order to get the information. Um, step two is to determine the enrollments, either actual or estimated in those courses. And there's a lot of variation in terms of what's happening out there. Again, if you have course marking, typically it's going to be easier to get to enrollment. Um, but even then, some folks are still using estimates. So they'll measure it one semester. That's a typical semester. And then they'll apply that across multiple um, semesters. Ideally, we're using actuals. But Again, especially when you're talking to policymakers, those estimates, they do provide magnitude and they do provide um, direction and that's what's going to be most important. And then step three is multiplying those enrollments by the cost of the resources replaced by OER. And this is a place where there's a lot of variation in the field around how we approach defining that multiplier. So 
I forgot I had this slide, but this one talks about the critical actions for step one and step two. Um, so critical actions for understanding enrollment are creating a standard definition, ensuring faculty members and or staff know about that definition, and creating a mechanism for collecting the information. The key enabler is, of course, Mark. When we look at measuring cost savings, like I said, this is where there's um, the most amount of variation. So um, the options tend to kind of fall into three categories. They fall into actual replacement costs. So this is for people who know which material has been replaced by the OER that is being implemented. About 41% of, per of the respondents in our survey are doing this. And so I thought that was a really promising number. Um, and there's a lot of different ways um, that you can do this, but a lot of it's gonna fall on the faculty member being able to articulate what is being replaced. The second approach that folks are using is an average textbook cost measure. So many of you are probably familiar with a study in 2018 by Spark, which um, used a nationally representative sample of institutions and then the top enrolled courses in those institutions and looked at the cost of textbooks in those courses. Um, the lowest cost, so they looked at, you know, if there was a used textbook, they would use that from the bookstore. And then from there, they were able to calculate that on average, the multiplier should be about $117. Um, there's another approach that folks are using, which is the student reported spending on course materials. So this is the NAIC Student Watch Survey. Um, has this, and their most recent survey says that 50 students report spending $53 per course on course material. OpenStax uses um, the national survey that I believe it's the NIPSAS data, um, which where students estimate that they spend about $79 on course material per course. One of the cautions we have around these approaches is that they the, the, the embedding inequity can happen here because many of those students might be choosing not to spend on course material that they would have otherwise purchased if they could have afforded it. And so just being aware of that as we look at these different um, measures is gonna be really important. In our own survey, we asked every respondent to report what level of cost savings they were realizing and the average or they were using in their own calculations and their average was $116. And so there seems to be the kind of a sense that the field is using somewhere between 90 and $116 to as the multiplier for cost savings. This is likely to change, especially as innovation continues. And so it's important to continue to watch that. Oh, and finally, you'll see that there's the general estimate that came from OEN a number of years ago of $100. So that kind of, I mean, it makes sense, right? It falls within the $90 and $116 that we saw in our own survey results. So the benefits, how do we account for the benefits and costs? So as I talked about earlier, one of the things with return on investment calculations was there was also always, uh, or there's often a disconnect between who benefits and who realizes it, who pays. And so what we wanted to do is to make that more transparent, which is why we use the approach of benefit cost analysis. And there are three steps to perform a benefit cost analysis. The first is to brainstorm the key factors. The second is to identify and categorize costs and benefits that could be realized from whatever the, um, whatever the different alternatives are. And then the third is to compare your benefits and costs. So in terms of brainstorming key factors, there are three things that we recommend you look at. One is what are your alternatives? So if you're not going to implement OER, what are you going to do? Are you using the textbook that you've been used for, using for the last 20 years? Are you replacing it with a new um, textbook that does not fall into the definition or textbook or set of resources that do not fall into the definition of OER? Are you using inclusive access? All of these things have different benefits and costs associated with them. And so we wanna take stock of what are our alternatives? 
The second is, who are the stakeholders who are going to be impacted? If you're looking at the state level, you might be looking at students, you might be looking at institutions, you might be looking at um, the state itself. If you're at an institutional level, perhaps you're looking at the students and the faculty and maybe a department. And then finally, what are the assumptions that you're making? Um, one common assumption that a number of programs are making is how long they can account for the cost savings of OER resources. If the, um, you know, once they get implemented, is it a five-year time span? Is it a seven-year time span? And so what this process does is it encourages you to think through all of those different factors that are important in your local context. The second thing to do is to identify and categorize costs and benefits that could be realized. So this is just an example. Interestingly enough, some of these things could go in different buckets at different times, but you know, some of the costs that we know might be associated with OER are things like developing courses, um, creating, uh, having time to manage the systems, materials costs, implementation costs, reduce revenue. Um, similarly, something like, like implementing a textbook might have costs with it and similar or um, creating a rental program at your institution. Um, the second thing is thinking about what are the quantifiable benefits and then what are the qualitative benefits? And so things like student retention can actually be quantified a lot of times. So if you can attribute a certain amount of student retention or course completion, you might actually be able to turn that into a quantifiable benefit for your initiative. And then also it's important to continue to identify the qualitative benefits because this there are a lot of things that we do in higher education that are not meant to be quantified. And then once you do that, you can kind of put it into a framework that allows you to look at things um, in comparison to each other. So filling out a grid or uh, some kind of tool in order to account for those various different things. It's also very helpful for conversations that you're having if you are going to be advocating for a new policy or talking about why your approach is better than other alternatives. So I know I've said a lot today. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to hear your ideas. And I'm also, um, Happy to just kind of hear your perspectives on this as we, I know we have a, a number, or a, we still have a number of minutes that we can have a broader conversation. So thank you all and thanks so much for letting me be here. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, that was very informative um, to look at everything because I know within our state, we've been trying to figure that out and we've used Sparks number um, to measure savings, but not everything, right? So. Any questions for Katie? So we've done a thorough job. Um, I wanna thank you, Katie, for coming, uh, spending time with us, sharing all of this great information. And, and as we continue forward, it's going to impact what we do more and more with OER, right? So this work um, is gonna be foundational for how we continue to improve for every institution as we go as a state. And I think that's something as we look forward to how do we share with administration and um, legislators, uh, it's gonna be very impactful um, on how we continue forward and, and the support we get behind it. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I have, a, I have a question if folks, if anyone's up for answering it, I am very curious as to what are the major barriers for you in your own um, conversations for talking about things like cost savings and return on investment? No one, no one, no one has thoughts on that. That's okay. I, yeah, uh, it is, uh, for me, at, at the beginning, it was quality, right? Ensuring the quality of the OER. Now we've gotten beyond that point. Um, and now it's the time that faculty need to implement it and supplemental resources. So other than that, there's a lot of, from top down, there's a lot of support uh, at our institution. And I know at our state uh, level, I'll, I'll not to speak on behalf of the Iowa OER team, but I know they're very... Uh, willing to support any institution um, wanting to move forward with the initiative. 
Very cool. Right. Well, thanks again for letting me me join you all today. All right. Thank you very much, Katie. You have a wonderful day. Enjoy Denver.